Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today I have an assortment of terrifying dogman encounters to share with you. Before we get into those, though, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click that like button. It only takes a second. And please leave a comment. All of these things, they definitely help. And guys, they really do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's upload, shall we? Alright guys, I really would like to apologize for last night's live stream. I have no idea what was going on. I know that we were having a snow and mild ice storm, um, but in the middle of it, my Wi-Fi completely went out, and for some reason, my mic was not working very well last night. So I apologize. I had a lot of fun, and uh, it seems like those of you that were there did as well, but... Once again, sorry. I really do feel <laughs> feel uh, real bad about it. So hopefully next week will be better. All right, let's get into it. Today's first terrifying experience comes to us from Middle Tennessee. Hello, my name is Dalton. and This is a memory I think I need to share. It has sat with me for a long time and I do not wish it to happen to anyone. Now, a little bit about myself. I have lived near a cemetery and experienced a wide variety of paranormal or unusual things that have happened, and none of those could compare to this. I can handle weird things that don't usually bother me as much as a normal person. I hate to even think of what happens. It makes me sick to my stomach. Here are the events that took place in late March of 2013. Myself, 16, my friend Cody, 19, and Cameron, 15, got up at around 1 p.m. in the afternoon on March 12th. We'd all been hanging out for the last few days and figured we'd invite some girls to go camping and go find a remote place to drink and have a little party. Well, that was the plan anyway. We've all camped out and went way out into the forest before, so we were definitely experienced when it comes to camping. Cody, being an aspiring survivalist, was really good at finding food or making shelter, so we would be dropped off for days at a time with little to no worries about anything. Not to mention, all of us were dropouts, so we didn't have school to worry about, so time was not a problem. All we had was to enjoy life. So we made these plans and borrowed two tents from Cody's parents. And we had asked his parents where a really secluded place would be in the woods and water would be near. Their parents' names, a few places. And we weren't really interested in any that they had suggested until Cody's mom had said, Hey hun, what about over there off the slaughterhouse road? At that point, Cody's dad said, no, they can't go there, that's too far. And you remember how it's really odd out there. Which immediately piqued our interest. So we started to ask his dad about this place. He tells us the nearest gas station is 30 miles away. That this place is down an old highway, then you turn down a dirt road, drive for 20 miles on that road. There is only one house halfway down, and it is abandoned. At the end of the road is a creek and an abandoned slaughterhouse that the roof collapsed in on. We would be surrounded by very thick woods. After some arguing and convincing, he agreed to take us as long as we only stayed till Monday. 
which would only be two days. So with that in mind, we found some girls who would meet us down there later that night. We got our stuff loaded up in the back of the truck and took off down there. We stopped at the gas station, got some snacks, beer, drinks, and continued on our way. Now, when we get to the road, I looked for a road name, and I just couldn't see one. It looked almost as if this road had never been named, which didn't really strike me as odd at the time. So we're about 10 miles into this road, and we come across the abandoned house that's just off to the right on this long, windy road. I happened to take notice that there was still a mower and gardening supplies that were in the yard, so... I took note of that and figured me and my friends could come back and scavenge the area. Maybe we'd find something cool to keep. Finally, after what seemed like forever, we make it down to the slaughterhouse in the creek bed. And it's beautiful. The water is see-through. You can see the bottom, see fish. The overall landscape is just amazing. We cannot believe why no one is down there because of how the scenery is. It should be well well-known camping spot, but again, not much thought about it, and we figured we just got a new spot to our pretty much ourselves, and now we can just take it over. So we immediately get out, grab our things, start to explore and unpack. Now it's about 6. The girls are supposed to meet us around 8.30, so we start walking around and exploring. Now at that point, everything's pretty much set up, and we explore the near area. Me and Cody like our beer, so we start to drink and fish. Cameron, on the other hand, isn't a real drinker. He's more or less a loner, and we pulled him into our little group to pull him out of his shell. Me and Cody were pretty popular. We just didn't find big groups fun, so me and him kind of just hung out with the three of us, though we could have more. So, me and Cody more or less felt free in the woods, and we are definitely the outdoorsy type. Cameron really was just there because he had no one else to hang out with. He didn't really enjoy being in the wilderness, but he enjoyed being with us. Well, 7.30 comes by, and the girls call us and say they are heading this way. So we go tell Cody's parents they can take off. As Cody's dad starts to leave, he calls Cody over and hands him a 44 revolver and said, Last time we were here, we heard a lot of coyotes, so keep this nearby and use your head. While being out here, you're further away than you guys are used to being. And pulled off. We weren't worried about it because he was always calling his dad to get us if something went wrong. There was barely a signal here, but if you stand on a big hill, you could get enough just to text or call that one spot. So we waited to hear from the girls, and they said they were almost there. We began making a fire as the sun begins to set. The girls finally arrive. We all start hanging out, drinking, and having an overall good time. Everything was great until 12.30 rolls around. We are all in separate tents, and whatever girl we had got with that night, me and this girl Savannah is who I was with. She keeps saying she's creeped out and hearing things walking around our tent. I keep telling her it's probably Cody or Cameron to quit worrying. An hour later, I hear what sounds like footsteps walking around the tent, and by this time, I should note that Savannah is asleep beside me. So I'm just listening to them kind of slowly prance around and I'm not really concerned so I say still drinking Cody to which I get no response so just keep listening and it dawns on me that there is an extra step for every step which means it's an animal and after a minute I come to the conclusion that it's a deer so I call out to Cody who's in the tent 40 feet from mine on the other side of Cameron's he calls back asking if I hear it as well. As soon as I said that the animal knocked over a can of beer and boom, trots away, Cody and I get out of our tent shortly after and start looking around. We don't see any tracks. It was like there was nothing outside of the tent when we knew we heard something. The ground was soft too, 
so we should have seen tracks, but it's whatever. We finally get back to the tent and fall asleep until around 3.30 comes. We hear thunder in the distance, do a pop-up storm, and all of us are awake now. So now we are all inside the tent and watching the storm roll in and hoping it won't get bad because our area was really easy for these storms to get really bad and quick. But the storms are just barely moving alongside of us. We can just see the lightning and hear the thunder and no rain. After 20 minutes of listening to the storm and chatting, one of the other girls noticed something in the woods, and it looked like a pair of eyes. We started looking closer and staring, and sure enough, it was a set of eyes. Cody grabs the gun and keeps it on him as we watch the eyes watch us. We are all a little on edge, but don't think it's much more than a dog or another animal that has been in contact with humans. So we're just watching them. They all of a sudden slowly stand up to about seven feet tall. And then we are worried. Cody fires a warning shot off and yells, telling the animal to get out of here. The eyes don't even flinch, so now he takes aim and fires again. So the eyes turn and head back into the woods, and we hear this loud crunching from how big this creature was as it broke branches and slowly walked off. We're all still sitting there in mild shock, trying to make sense of what this animal was, when we hear this very loud, ear-ringing howling coming from the direction of the animal, which freaks the girls out enough for them to say nope. They pack up and are about to go home. They get into their car and ask if we want to go, which we figured, yeah, we might want to go, but at the time, we could just go home in the morning. So we are debating on staying or going, and we finally decide to stay and convince ourselves that it's just a bear. We all go to our tents and are just silent to the point where we all know we are awake and freaked out and couldn't sleep. Thirty minutes later, we hear just things moving and walking around in the woods. It's important to note when nightfall came that night, all the wildlife went silent. It was so quiet your ears would ring occasionally. But somehow we all managed to fall asleep, and when sunrise came, we woke up and all started making breakfast. Now it was daylight, we weren't really freaked out anymore, and me and Cody started making jokes about the night before. Cameron was not joking, he was really scared. After calling him a wimp enough, he finally said that sometime in the night he woke up and something was standing over his tent, and he could just hear breathing and really deep breathing. We thought he was lying, but we left it alone until Cody went back to where he saw something standing over his tent, and right there were huge footprints. They were at least eight and a half inches wide and about ten inches long, almost like a huge dog print. After that, we kind of didn't speak of it, just kind of ignored it, covered it up so it wouldn't scare Cameron. We went about our day and finally started having fun again. We decided instead of going home, we'd stay for another night, despite what had happened. Everything was fine for the rest of the day. Now we're all getting ready to lie down when Cody puts the obvious out there. Again, the woods fell silent. So we just said, let's go to sleep as fast as we can, wake up and get out of here tomorrow. We're all on the edge, but somehow managed to go to sleep. Something during the night, we were woken by someone or something screaming at the top of their lungs. Me and Cody jump out of the tent as fast as we could. Cameron's tent is literally ripped open and thrown ten feet into the water. Cody grabs his gun and takes off running, screaming for Cameron, and falling and screaming. Finally, after two miles, we find him running caught up bleeding with a broken arm. We grab him and we start running as fast as we can along this access road. And behind us, the woods, a little way back we hear something trailing us. So Cody fires two shots towards it as we are running. 
We ran so far we made it to the abandoned house and barricaded ourselves inside as Cody was making the phone call to his parents. He finally gets a hold of them and they start rushing toward us, but they are still an hour away. So now we had to hope we could make it through that hour. We're scared that something is going to burst through that door any minute and kill us. But 30 minutes go by and there's no sign of this creature whatsoever. We keep looking out the windows and don't see anything. Cameron has yet to say a word since we found him. Then Cody looks out the window, and there, right out in the woodlands, on the edge of the trees, is the creature's eyes. We all panic, and Cody realizes he only has two bullets left in the gun. We watch the creature for what seemed like forever, and then our worst nightmare happens. It starts running towards us, and walking around the house, banging on the walls and windows. We never could get a clear glimpse of this thing, and I'm very happy for that. Finally, we see headlights, and the banging stops. His father gets out and starts firing an AR-15 rapidly at least two magazines before screaming to us, hurry, get into the truck. We're all silent on the way to the hospital. We got there, and Cameron was admitted and we all kind of knew not to say anything that actually happened on the account of sounding crazy. So Cody and all of us went back to the house, didn't sleep very well that night, but somehow we did get some sleep. Finally in the morning we asked Cameron if he got a good look at the creature. He said he was asleep and then dragged out of his tent by his arm, which broke it and dragged him for over a mile before it dropped him and he started running towards us. He said that whatever it was was taller than him and covered in hair and had these really big yellow glowing eyes. Sort of kind of resembled a dog, but not really. To this day, we have never gone back out there and I will never go back again for no reason whatsoever. Whether you guys believe me or not, I could care less. Just don't go to places like what I just described. I just needed to get this off of my chest. Even now as I'm typing this, I'm looking over my shoulder. And to this day, I have nightmares of what could have happened to us all. After that, we all kind of drifted apart. Never really hung out after that or told the story that I am sharing right now. Today's second terrifying experience. For a bit of backstory, I worked the graveyard shift in North Carolina mountains. Working these dark hours kind of leaves limited things to occupy my time on my days off. Normally, I'd just go out driving, hiking, walking in the dark if you don't have a video game I want to play or a movie to watch. With this hobby, I often come across unusual things in the darkness. I've experienced things I cannot forget. Or I hear things when I'm alone that make me want to faint. They all range from normal scary to downright terrifying paranormal, like this experience. This happened about a year ago. I've been scared to talk about it because every time I do, when the dark comes, there's always a noise or a bad feeling that comes to me and whomever I am around, but I'll talk more about that later. Well, it was my night off. I was kind of getting bored with lying around watching YouTube while I fell asleep. So like most weekends, now that it's getting warmer, I decide to go out for a drive. It's about one in the morning, cloudless, so I head up to the parkway like normal. It's bound to be beautiful drive. Nope, closed. Well, dang, where do I go now? I think, oh, Pisgah Forest. I haven't been there since high school. Perfect, an adventure. And drive. It's about three in the morning by the time I get to the entrance of the forest. It's already looking pretty foreboding. The entrance is smack in the middle of a tourist tubing, ice cream, and souvenir haven. All brightly lit parking lots and cute signs, but the entrance is complete opposite. 
It's a long straight road with absolutely no lights disappearing into the night. Only campers go up there after dark. I don't think much of it. It's nighttime, of course, and it looks scary. Everything looks scary in the dark, so I drive. Everything's pretty normal for a while. I pass by a turnoff for picnics and campgrounds. All dark, but the higher I climb in the mountain, the more anxious I feel. Something is not right. I'm normally fine in the night. It's my time. But something feels very off. Keep pushing on. The winding road climbs higher and higher. Forest is all around me. Thick and serene. The air is warm and the smell is so good and musty. The only light around is from my headlights, but I cannot shake that bad feeling. I try to ignore it, thinking maybe it's because I can't see the moon. Like when I go on the parkway. Yeah, that's it. It's got to be. But as the climb gets steeper, the more afraid I am. My chest is tight and becoming painful, but I keep going, just trying to ignore it. I'm passing waterfalls, hearing the water roaring out of sight. I should be relaxed, but I cannot be. After an hour and a half, I notice the turnoffs are few and far between. I haven't passed any in a while. The pain in my chest is alarming me, and I'm considering heading back down. Suddenly, I smell something unusual. You ever remember being little and your parents having that particular smell that you remember, like a perfume or a cologne they may wear that you immediately recognize into your adult years as them? Well, my dad was a factory worker and a smoker, so from a young age, he always smelled of motor oil, harsh metal, coffee, and cigarettes. An odd combination, but it's him. And that's the smell I smell. In the middle of the woods, with nothing but trees and clean air around. I smelled my dad. It was subtle, but I get the hint. I need to turn my ass around and go home now. I drive onwards till I find a safe place to do a K-turn. Around a tight turn, I found a good spot away from the guardrails to initiate the move maneuver. Right as I got my car straightened back, I stopped it dead. The smell of rot had flooded through my open window, and there, inches from my front bumper, was this huge creature. It was crouched down, looking at the dirt. The body, it was not right. It looked like a big, hairy dog crouched on all fours, but the legs, they were too long to be normal legs. My eyes moved up to its head, a human head. Long, dark hair covered its face. I couldn't see, but its eyes, I could see them. And they met mine, reddish, orange, glowing back at me. My heart felt like I was going to stop and tears started filling my eyes. I hadn't been this scared in my entire life. My heart felt like it was definitely going to stop. And that horrible smell was suffocating. The creature started to move, and I don't know what happened. It was like my body flipped a switch. I wasn't thinking anymore. I didn't feel anything. I just stomped the gas pedal, veered around this creature, and sped off down the mountain. I feel like I should have clipped it with my car. It was so close, but I don't remember recognizing that I connected with anything. I don't remember anything up until my phone ringing long after I left the forest. It was my twin. She felt like something was wrong and had been trying to get a hold of me for an hour and a half. I drove back to her house and explained the whole thing waiting for the sun to come up. This has been one of the most terrifying experiences that has ever happened to me alone so far and every time I tell someone something unexplained happens. When I told my twin that night, she heard some banging on her closet door with no one or nothing inside of it. When I told my parents, my mother saw some red eyes in the woods when she went out to smoke a cigarette. When I told my fella the next evening, we both heard a crash outside, but when we looked, there was nothing amiss. Then when I was leaning beside the window, I saw the curtain move in one spot. I felt a breath beneath me. I flipped and hid on the other side of the room till morning. We're on a second floor. 
I don't know if it was the same creature and it somehow followed me across counties or something else, warning me not to talk about it. So I don't know if anything will happen after I share this. I hope not. I still go driving at night. It's actually my night off, but I'm going to stay home tonight and play it safe. Today's third encounter. This is not my experience. It's my boyfriend's. I'll try to recall it as closely as I can. I was talking to him about scary things that had happened to me and my family and decided to ask, has anything weird or supernatural ever happened to you? And he said that, yes, something weird did happen to him once, but that he did not want to talk about it. He was very adamant on not telling me this story, but of course I was curious, and with about 20 minutes of prodding, he finally breaks down and opens up. His face was buried in the pillow, and when he did speak, I noticed his voice was actually shaking a bit. He said, you know how grizzly bears are apex predators, right? And I replied, yeah, of course I knew that. He goes on and tells me about how his family and him had gone on a hiking, hunting trip when he was about 14, and how he wandered off the trail on his own to explore a bit, rifle in hand. He was just looking around enjoying the scenery when he heard something that sent shivers down his spine, the blood-curdling cry of a grizzly bear. He said that it went on for about 15 seconds before abruptly stopping. Terrified, but curious, he went off in the direction he heard the cry. I guess he must have assumed that it was caught in a trap. Eventually, he came across a small stream, a large grizzly bear laying on top of it, the blood trickling down along with the water. He cautiously approaches, poking it with the rifle. It didn't move, so yeah, it was very dead. However, this is not what scared him. So he was looking at this bear from behind and could only see its back. But when he walked around to the front, that's what terrified him. At this point in the story, he was actually a bit teary-eyed. He told me that it was completely howled out. There were no guts at all. And... He even said that he would have been able to crawl inside and have room to spare. Now, of course, he didn't stay long, quickly heading back and meeting up with the group. And I'm just left to wonder, what kind of creature exists out there that could howl out a grizzly bear in 15 seconds? Of course, I'm just glad he didn't have his own little run-in with whatever did this. I'm sure if he did, there would not be much left of him right now. Today's fourth encounter. I opened the door one night to see if the cats wanted in the house before I went to bed. All of the neighborhood dogs were barking. I listened for a while. In the midst, I could hear a noise I could not quite define. It was perhaps half a yip of an angry chihuahua and half a screech of a ringwraith. I remember telling my girlfriend how odd it was. A night or two later, I woke up to one of my two Labradors barking. I got up and left the bedroom to see what was the matter. She was barking insanely while her mother sat quietly. Knowing how overdramatic the younger dog was, I was angry and went to quiet her down. Then I heard it, the same crazy sound from the other night. I hurried back to my room. I hurried to find my glasses and grab my pistol. I was worried because of our cats were outside. When I went back to the living room, I looked out the window to spot a creature. The moon was so bright, the ground was white. Yet, still, I saw nothing. Then I heard the noise again. It was so close and so powerful, the window vibrated. I knew it was close, but I could not see it. I wanted to go fetch my larger caliber rifle, but I was worried about the time. Once again, the cats were outside, and I knew my girlfriend would blame me if anything happened to them. So I went out the door, 
Luckily, the moment I opened the door, both of them bolted from the pile of leaves they were hiding under. I contemplated going outside, but it was detoured by this powerful growl and the fact that I could not see it. I went back inside and went to the kitchen. I heard it again, and much lower in tone. Just then I realized whatever it was was hiding just below the stairs away from my garage. It wanted me to follow. I stayed inside. I have no idea what it was. What I do know is that it's a hunter and it wanted to bait me. I grabbed my AK and put it next to my bed. I didn't figure an animal would dare attempt to breach my house. But its sound was so peculiar I decided to prepare for anything. I still have no idea what it was. But I still step out and try to listen to it every once in a while. Today's final encounter. On a rainy day in Arizona, I was driving past a deep woodland area to visit my dad. While driving past, I noticed this impossibly tall figure, all black, moving from left to right, right to left, left to right, right to left. Creeped out, I decided to speed up down the road until I took a sharp left on a dirt road leading to two cabins where my dad lived. The following night, my dad and I are drinking beers and watching sports when the power suddenly cuts off. Being out in the woods, my dad just assumed it was a bad signal, so we just decide to go and have a long chat out back. Twenty minutes after talking, we heard a faint laugh coming from behind the second cabin. As we went to check it out, I saw that same figure that I saw driving past in the woods. I whispered to my dad that I had seen it earlier and that it probably followed me here. After a few seconds of staring, we saw the figure crawl on all fours at an incredibly fast pace circling us. After it had done two laps around us, we dashed to my car and sped off into the night, unsure if this thing was following. At around 8 in the morning, we decided to go back and get some shut-eye considering how we had been up all night trying to guess what this thing could have been. When we arrived there were police cars and ambulances surrounding the neighbor's cabin. When my dad asked what had happened, the officer he was talking to explained how there were reports of an impossibly tall figure moving around the second cabin and to get him off their property only to arrive to a bloody scene and a tall shadowy figure eating the remains of the assumed victim who had called. When I asked if they knew what the thing was, the officer said that this thing jumped out the window and crawled off into the night. To this day, we still have no idea what this creature was. Now, my dad and I now live in Bedfordshire in England because we never felt safe in America, no matter where we went. We just felt like something was following us, but we don't feel that now. My mom told me that she was going to Arizona to try to figure out what this mystery creature was. She was found dead in her cabin, missing an arm and a leg. To this day, I always get nightmares and sleep paralysis every time I go to sleep. All right, guys, like I said at the beginning of the upload, an assortment of terrifying encounters. I hope you guys enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. Also, once again, guys, I apologize about last night. I'm going to go through and uh, figure out what exactly went wrong because um, from the very first live stream, I went and had Spectrum as my Wi-Fi carrier. I've got two routers in my house, one one essentially just for this channel. Um, I've got brand new mics and like I've got a Yeti Blue Pro um, and AKG condenser mic, a regular Yeti. And uh, I have no idea what went on. It was absolutely insane. So um, hopefully... Hopefully it doesn't happen next week, but uh, I don't know. Anyway, 
I apologize. I hope you guys enjoyed today's upload as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Guys, stay safe, stay healthy, and may the Great Spirit watch over us all and may He guide us down that path we call life.